Sławomir Zborowski. Thank you guys. Actually, the first thing I'd like to thank you for coming because this is like the last slot in the conference. Hopefully you will not fall asleep. So you already know my name. Uh, before I start, let me quickly introduce myself to you. I'm a senior software engineer at Nokia and I'm based here in Wrocław. Uh, I started, at least the professional part started in about 2010 and well, it continues still till today. <laughs> Hopefully, yes, uh, tomorrow I will be still here. Uh, okay, and for the last two years I was doing distributed applications, and this is why I decided to talk about this topic. I'm still using C++, but uh, I had a project that required some other set of functionality, and, and this is why now I'm more into Python. But it's still a programming language, right? So how many of you are working with distributed apps? Show your hands, please. Okay, a lot of you, that's, that's great. So, it's, it's great because we all know what I'm talking about. Let me, before I go to the presentation, let me just add a couple of things. The first thing is uh, how it looks in IT world after um, seven years. Maybe you share the same, um, maybe you share the same uh, opinion. How many of you have more than five years of experience in IT? Okay some of you, so maybe you will agree with me that it changes very quickly, so uh, the changes are very rapid. So when I started, hot topics were like virtual machines, uh, XML was for some reason a number one configuration file format, now we are going into JSON, now we are not talking about uh, virtual machines but microservices and containers, so when compared to other scientific disciplines, it's rapid. Uh, what we can see. So uh, just a couple of years and you are basically out of business. But on the other hand, it's like fashion because we can see some recurring pattern. For instance, microservices is something that the concept was developed in the 70s, I guess, with Unix, right? We, you have a couple of small programs and you need to build something bigger uh, by using those small programs. And it is the same thing, but the execution context is different. So if we talk about stuff like microservices versus monolithic applications or SQL versus no SQL, it's hyped, then we have a latent period, and then it is hyped again, and it continues like this. So that's just a reflection from my side. Now, about this presentation, I'm not going to let you know how to succeed with building distributed apps because there is no silver bullet. I'm going to talk about failures that uh, you maybe will make while on the path and hopefully you can get something out of this presentation. And also the question why this is important topic at all. Well, we see this trend that is called cloud shift. More and more applications are moved to the cloud and uh, some with a reason, some without a reason. Definitely one of the reasons is that we, as humans, we generate so much data that it isn't possible for single node apps to keep up with this. It's, it's like we need to distribute the software so, so it can handle the load that we generate. Okay, but let's get to, to the presentation itself. I'm going to start with letting you know what is the difference between single node apps and distributed apps. Then we will talk about trade-offs that we need to make then we will see how we can test and maintain distributed apps. And finally, I will share just a couple of mistakes that we have made and I saw other projects sitting nearby that did the same set of mistakes. So I think it is worth talking about it. So let's start. I was thinking about how to explain to you the difference in a good fashion. And it is actually quite hard to squash everything into one sentence that explains it all. In the meantime, I was reading this excellent book by Martin Kleppmann entitled Designing Data Intensive Applications. I can recommend this book even if I haven't finished it yet. But right in the middle, there is a paragraph that was so close to what I was trying to say in this presentation that I have decided just to include it here. And it goes like this. Working with distributed system is fundamentally different from writing software on a single computer, and the main difference is that there are lots of new and exciting ways for things to go wrong. 
And I think, yes, we all know that software fails. So what can happen when you distribute the software? It's going to fail more frequently, and this, this is the case. Maybe it's not a perfect uh, sentence for explaining it, but it's quite close, I guess. Uh, OK, and uh, now let's see how does it correlate uh, to real life. So let's talk, let's talk about communication in single-owned apps and distributed apps and to what we can correlate this in real life. So when you have a CPU and you are exchanging messages between threads, I think you can correlate this to whispering, like talking something to, 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 to somebody, right? Because the possibility that the message will not be delivered is almost, uh, it's almost impossible. I don't know what could be the reason, like supermassive black hole appearing out of space. Uh, otherwise, the message will be delivered and it's like it, there, there's simply no possibility that something will fail. And it's also the same with uh, single note messaging. It's like you can be almost sure that it will work. Maybe stuff like burning CPU can, can uh, make it fail. But have you ever seen a failure in sending messages between, uh, between threads that was related to hardware? One hand, OK. So only one in, in a room full of geeks. So this, this explains it all. Uh, so when I compare single note messaging to whispering, then give me some example for remote messaging. What can I use, for example? Come again? Pigeons. Pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> you guessed it. So maybe you will know, you know, I think that it, uh, you will call me crazy, right? But there is even this RFC document called IP over avian carriers. So it's not a joke. Of course, it was published on April Fool's Day. But actually, there is an implementation and uh, where is it? They have 55% of packet loss ratio, but it was only due to a user error. <laughs> I didn't dig enough to, to see why, but actually it's kind of funny, right? But if we start talking about pigeons and start talking about real stuff and consider that we want to transfer a packet from Wrocław to Manila, that is in Philippines, then what is roughly the distance? Who, who knows? Uh, 10,000 kilometers, yes, exactly. So when we would, if we could have a perfectly straight fiber optic, then just sending one packet and receiving some response would take 50 milliseconds, okay? And now 50 milliseconds sounds like a tiny portion of time, right? Uh, but it happens that for computers it's a lot. You can read one megabyte of data sequentially from SSD in just one millisecond. So it means you can, in the same time, you can read like 50 megabytes. And it's crazy. And even if you shrink the problem, even if you put computers uh, to a single data center and uh, just connect them using network, then it's still like a long, uh, so it's still too long, and computer can do a lot of stuff in between. So uh, the, the first lesson is that it's actually slow. Remote communication is simply slow. But the more interesting thing is that it's actually unreliable. So now another question, maybe you will know this shark. There is a shark that is very popular. This shark tried to cut a cable between US and Europe, and it was caught on camera. And it was caught red-handed, but uh, since sharks don't have hands, so I, I think we should coin a new term like uh, red fint or something like this. So this is, this is the case. Even nature can kick in, and because of the nature, the communication might, might fail. But aside of a nature, there is something that is going to fail more frequently. And it, it's just a fact that failure in scale is common, commonplace, and you'll see in a moment, because now we are going to talk about hard drives. A hard drive like this, I have pulled out a hard drive out of old PC, and question to you, how often such a thing will fail? Once per how many years? What is your guesstimate? Two, three, five, that's a good guesstimate. 
And it's actually quite a good result, you may think, because you put this hard drive into your PC and it's working for five years, well, it's okay, right? But then if you set up a data center and you have 10,000 computers and each of them has two hard drives, then you will need to replace a couple of hard drives uh, each day. So you will be running with hard drives just, and just to replace them. And that's, that's funny because it shows us that uh, failure is a common place in a bigger scale. And uh, now I'd like to switch to the software, but before I do so, I would like to touch other topic. Uh, as already mentioned, I was responsible for escape room for, for this edition of Code Dive. And while preparing Riddles, I decided to, to have racks with switches and servers. And it is obvious, but some things are obvious, and we see this, but we don't try to infer any facts from this. So when I was looking at this hardware, it became apparent that even when we look at the hardware, we can get some facts about it. How does it look in data center? So now, can I ask a volunteer? You just need to have hands and brain. That's Michal. Okay, so you will count seconds, and Michal will try to pull hard drive out of this server. So start. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Nine. ten, Nine. eleven, Nine. twelve. <laughs> okay. Well, if if I yes, if I had okay, if I had a data center, I would not hire you because <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> and now this is how it should look like. I just click here and pull it. It's it's like this. You can just click and pull it, so it's so easy, and it's interesting because. You can pull, uh, thank you, thank you, Michal. So also the fan, it's so easy to, to pull a fan out. I have a fan, right? And also power unit bank, I have it, right? So now the question is, what is common for those things? Sorry? Brake? Fans, mechanical parts, right? There's, there's engine in, in a hard drive. There's moving part here and also in this power supplier or something. So basically, this is the common part, and it's ki kind of obvious that it will fail. But the, the, my point is that if hardware vendor is making such a hardware in, in, in such a way, that it means that it needs to fail more frequently than other parts. And if, it's, if you are able to just extract a hard drive in just a couple of second, seconds, it means that that it is going to fail very frequently. Okay, and now if you are writing an application, you need to take this into account that in such a data center, everything will fail uh, quite frequently, and you will have a situation called a partial failure, and the partial failure is quite important stuff that we need to take into account while working with distributed apps. And here comes another analogy. Uh, but before I do this, let me also add one more thing. If we, uh, if we are doing distributed apps, it, if, because if single node application fails because of lacking uh, resources, like hard drive fails, it, it can crash, and it is quite acceptable. Because you need some resource, let it be such a drive. If, if such a drive fails in a single computer, you can give up. In distributed app, you should not give up because you have other resources in other machines, so it's you, you can still continue to execute. So even if there is a f even in presence of failures, you, sh you should continue to to execute, and maybe with some small disruption. That's that's all. Uh, and here comes this comparison to other scientific discipline, physics. So in physics, traditional physics, it's quite good because you can calculate everything, you will get exact results most of the time, and it is quite easy to reason about it, right? When we think about quantum physics, it is not so easy anymore. Uh, you can get a result that is both 0 and 1, and it is the same with single node apps and distributed apps. 
with distributed apps, it is very unlikely that you will have a, f a system that failed totally. And also, it is unlikely that you will have fully functional system for a, for a longer period of time. So we are going to be somewhere in between. If you are lucky, you will be closer to the right side uh, because of this failure, which is, which is actually commonplace. And some of you can say that, OK, let's buy better hardware so we can, so we can solve this problem entirely using hardware. But it is not possible, uh, unfortunately, and we need to solve this problem entirely in, in a software layer. And here comes one more analogy, this time to biology. So we have something that we can call an inspiration, and it is a brain. Because if we treat neurons as, as uh, hardware nodes, then software is, I don't know, I'm not into this science, so let's say consciousness or something, then basically it's, it's a miracle because it's a miracle because hundreds of neurons can die and we don't notice, at least the same day. So we don't notice, and this is like a perfect machine. Uh, hundreds of neurons are dying, we are fine. Sometime we, sometimes we don't even remember <laughs> that something has happened, so like <laughs> perfect thing. We, we would also like a client that, that will forget uh, you know, something that uh, happens in data centers, like recently uh, it was OVH. Uh, so basically this is what we are trying to do in distributed apps, right? So we want our system to be capable of surviving global maintenance breaks and other kind of disasters and also failures that are common, right? Now, we all use services that are distributed for sure, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Airbnb, Uber, and so on. How many of you have seen Google Down? Show your hands. Okay, when, when was it? A few years ago. So it seems that there is some algorithm that will solve all of the problems for us, and we don't need to make any trade-offs while, while doing this. Right? But apparently there is no silver bullet and we need to make trade-offs and here is why. Let's consider we have a simple system that is a distributed database and we can set some value and read from the database. Right? Now the question is, if I set here x to 42, now the question is what will be value here if it is quite close in, in, in time to, to this time point? Any idea? It depends, but it depends on many factors, right? And the one factor is a factor that you can't get rid of, and you can name it physics, right? Because you can't be faster than light. So if the information that you store here will not make its way uh, to this place very soon, uh, then this information will not be here uh, while this client is reading from the database. So we are not talking about some constraints that are abstract. This is physics, and we can't get rid of, of those constants. So basically, we need to have some trade-offs, and there are some constraints that, that we need to follow. And this is maybe it's not the best uh, uh, idea to, to describe it using CAP uh, theorem, but it's, it's like easy to, to understand, so I'm going to use it. It's about consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So consistent system is a system that uh, it doesn't matter who you will ask, you will get the same result because the system is uh, consistent, right? So all nodes agree on the same value. Then available system is a system that will give you answer as soon as possible, even if the answer is not consistent with the rest of the system. And finally, partition tolerance means that even in presence of failures, the system still continues to uh, execute, still makes progress, and so on. So basically, if I don't know if there is a system that uh, works in nature that is not tolerant to partitions. Basically, it can kill a business, so, so it's, it's something that is a need, as must have, so basically we are choosing between consistency and availability. So now, let me give you, because systems can be either CA, AP, or CP in this model, let me give you some other example that maybe you will understand in a better fashion. So let's consider you have a car that you need to repair. So we go to the service, and there is this triangle, 
and you al always want to have it both fast, good, and cheap, right? In something that, that we strive for. Now the question is, can we have those three traits at, at the same moment? Unfortunately not. What happens if we have something fast and cheap? It's not going to be good, right? Then if something is fast and good, then we will need to, to pay extra money for it to get done, to, to be done. And finally, if something is good and cheap, then it's not going to be fast because it will be uh, done slowly, right? So this is almost the same thing as here with consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So basically, you can't, you can't have cake and eat it, in other words. Okay, and if you are interested in if you are interested in this kind of stuff, then I recommend if if you are interested whether the database you are using in your project is is robust against uh, stuff like this, you can use this. You c I really highly recommend this blog. Call me maybe. Uh, it's just put your favorite database or something and append call me maybe in your favorite search engine like DuckDuckGo. And basically, the guy uh, will show you that there are some facts that you didn't know about this database, and what they claim in documentation is not always true. So I highly, highly recommend this, this thing. And the guy was also asked on, on the blog how long it takes for a single database to be tested. And I don't recall the answer exactly, but it was, it was counted in weeks, if I remember correctly. So it takes a couple of weeks to for this guy to test the database, which is crazy. And this way we smoothly go to the topic of testing distributed applications. So now I'm going to tell you something about testing and maintaining distributed applications. Uh, by the way, how many of you work with distributed applications and how many of you just maintain them? Let's start with the first. How, how many of you are implementing? OK, and now, now the maintenance. Okay, it's like 50-50. Some of guys are uh, doing both. Okay, uh, so it's obvious that if there is something that is complex and you need to test it, then the tests are not going to be easier, right? So uh, testing distributed apps is basically also going to be a difficult task because you need to think about all of edge cases, all of the failure scenarios that can possibly happen, and this is what makes it hard. And there is a project that I'd like to show you. It's called Blockade, and I think it's quite a good project that is not so popular, and I think it should gain more popularity because uh, you can use it to inject faults into running distributed system without even running a virtual machine. So th this is why I think we should all know about this. But before I do so, let me ask this maybe obvious question. How many of you know Docker? OK. Who, who don't know Docker? OK. <laughs> that's, that's what I expected, actually. So let's, because we don't have time for more than this, so let's have this simple example, contrived one, that we have a backend, and we can instruct a backend to download a file. Then it goes to the distributed queue, and then it's handled by Download worker, uh, so it's it's distributed in in place of a distributed queue. I have Redis, so it's not a rocket science, but I just want to to show you how we can test distributed apps. Uh, and Blockade is a tool that this is my logo. It's not because they don't have logos, so I try to do something on my own. And then I think I should not do any graphics. I should stay with programming. Nevertheless, now it's the time for console. So let me just switch here. So at the top, I have output from the download worker. And in the bottom, I have it's something like Docker Compose, but it's a blockade. Uh, and you can play around with network to inject the faults into running system. So basically, I have prepared this DL script. And its purpose is to simulate downloading a file of specified size. And if I use it, we can see that this file was downloaded in just a fraction of a second, which makes it almost impossible to, 
to test some weird network scenarios, with, and this is this is why we need to do something about it. And by the way, I am not faking anything. If you don't believe me, if I put this number, then it's almost one second. But still, it's it's downloading locally, so 25 uh, 256 megabytes. It's like almost nothing. It's just a second. Now, this is when blockade kicks in. This will do all of the IP tables and TC magic to make network flaky. So now the network will lose packets, it will duplicate packets, it will become slow. In just a one word, it will become unreliable. And now I am going to download again this one megabyte file. Now we can see it should be request number three. And we are waiting, okay? It started downloading, downloading it after couple of seconds. Now, I have no idea how long it is going to take. It can take from one minute up to even an hour. It all depends. So with this, you can see how easy you can inject a fault into running system. So how, how we can uh, make distributed application testing more easy and without any virtual machines. So I think this, this project is quite cool and should be more popular. Now, because we don't have time, uh, I will make the network fast again. Again, it takes a couple of seconds because of this magic that happens underneath. And then let's see whether it makes it. Because last time when I was doing this, it was yesterday, it claimed that it downloaded only part of the file. So let's wait for additional couple of seconds and see if it works at all. Okay, but you see, if this operation is so long, now we can introduce network partitions, you can simulate some garbage collection cycles and whatever you'd like to, to be... Oh, here. So <laughs> this is funny, right? Because it claims that it, have do it has downloaded only part of the file in 80 seconds. And it is TCP, right? So it's you can find bugs. Of course, my implementation was not very good, but you see, it's just a Redis with uh, AO HTTP, and it it's not working. It's not downloading full file, and it should be one megabyte, right? It, it isn't. Okay, but well let's switch to to the presentation. Hopefully you can use this blockade tool and you, you will find it useful in your project. So now let's talk about maintaining distributed apps. And here it all boils down to to a difference between pet and cattle. Perhaps you know this already. So single node, uh, single machine is like a pet. You can name it. You know its IP address. If you are crazy like me, you can even know its MAC address. Then you configure it by hand, and you basically know everything about this machine. Then if you change the context to the cloud, it's not possible anymore to, to, to remember all of the IP addresses, and you can't give names to, to cattle, right? We need to introduce some numbers and stuff like this. Uh, so basically, for the configuration, you need some tools like Ansible or a Puppet or something. So it's not easy anymore to, to manage those machines that are running in in the cloud. And just three examples how more difficult it is to work with distributed apps when they are deployed in the cloud. The first thing is the bugging or reproducing bugs. So what do you do if you want to reproduce a bug uh, in an application that runs on a single node? You use debugger or something that, that you have uh, installed on the computer and you set breakpoint here there, and after a couple of minutes, you're, if you're lucky, you can find a problem and reproduce it. When you start working with distributed apps, it's not so easy anymore, because you need to find a machine on which it has failed, and then you need to find what part of the application, because it is deployed in some way if you're using uh, stuff like Docker Swarm or Kubernetes, uh, and then you can find that machine is already gone. So there is a bug, but the machine was uh, disappeared, 
and there is other machine that is uh, playing the same role in the system. And maybe you, you, you can say that it's not happening, but it's actually what, what happens. At least maybe I'm unlucky, but some of my machines are assigned IP address of 0.0.0.0, and it happens once per week. So I leave those machines, and after some time I have uh, this IP address, and I cannot access those machines anymore. So if there is a bug on this machine, I have no mean to, to, to reproduce it and debug what has happened. So this is how more difficult, this is just an example, of course, you have more difficulties uh, that you need to fight when working with distributed apps. Also, logging is an interesting case, because you are not going to SSH into each machine uh, just to gather the logs and then grab through the log, right? You need to install some kind of centralized logging solution. In our case, we are using Elasticsearch with Logsearch and Kibana, but you can use anything you want, like Log Device or Kafka. And you can even argue that after being used to, to such a solution, you are fluent and you can use it as wrapping through the logs. But actually, it doesn't change the fact that you still need to deploy this somewhere. So we need more capacity, and also you need to have more scripts to deploy it. In other words, you are making your surface for bugs just bigger, and it's, it gets things simply, uh, it's more complicated there. Also, finding a bug uh, that is related to performance is, is going to be harder uh, in distributed apps, because on single node machines, you can use tools like IOTOP, uh, HTOP, and stuff like this, and in distributed system, you need to to also install some uh, install some uh, special software that is centralized, and then it's harder to find a bottleneck in a distributed uh, system. And I really recommend this book, Systems Performance. It's also a great book that you should know about. Okay, excellent and. Now, let's talk about the last thing, about uh, the last topic, it's the mistakes that we have made in our project, and I see some other projects that are sitting near to us, and they have made the same mistakes. Uh, and when I tell you that I have made mistakes, I'm not joking, actually, because this is a graph that shows you the load of our machines in our first production release. So. It started and it died uh, 30 minutes later. So it's, it was a long life, right? And we, <laughs> we weren't very happy uh, about how things went back then. So after finding a bug that was related to, to file systems, uh, we have extended its lifetime to one hour. <laughs> and then we found another bug and it was two hours and we are in the process and I'm quite worried because it, it looks that it's extending and uh, we can't get to the point where it's stable forever. Okay, number one problem that I have noticed is versioning dependencies. So please be sincere, how many of you at least once used the latest keyword? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> we know you do this because we are lazy. So if you do such a thing, then you're going to regret it after. Uh, it depends, actually. It depends on, on how often the author of this dependency will make changes. And we are working also with JavaScript, so it's like on a daily basis almost. So, uh, the guys are changing APIs, and they don't uh, put this into, in, in, into the documentation. So. Uh, from time to time, you don't change anything in your project, you just build it one more time and it, it's broken. And it is the better case. The worst case is that you change something and also this dependency is changed. And then you basically are looking for a bug in your change set and it happens that there is no bug in your code, the bug is in, in the dependency file. And you may be tricked that things like semantic versioning is a cure for this. So you just select a version and then the minor part uh, can change. But again, if you are working with JavaScript, uh, th they don't give crap about this. I mean, 
They, they simply can change API even in minor version, which should not happen, but this is how it looks like. So I highly recommend to, to look, waste five minutes, and find what is exactly the number, and put it in, in your file, and then you'll, you will basically save a couple of hours in later on. Right? Okay, the second thing that, that I saw, and also we made this mistake, you all know about premature optimization, right? It's a simple concept. You try to optimize something, you don't profile your application, and you end up with, uh, with optimizing a stuff that is never executed. So <laughs> this is how it works uh, most of the time. And in distributed applications, it's similar. We have, uh, I mean, uh, there, there is no such a term. It's we, shou we should coin it. But actually, there is no such a term. I call it premature scalability. It means that you start big like this, right? And you, you look, OK, now we have 10 users. In three months, we will have 10 million users. So should we take SQL or no SQL? Let's take no SQL, because we are going to have 10 million users. So we choose this technology. And after three months, you have 20 users. <laughs> and uh, by this time, you actually implemented a lot of stuff that would not be required if you have chosen simple solution in the first place. So you just choose some technology that will enable you to scale to the size of Google or Facebook. And then after a couple of months, you decide, uh, you actually see that this only brings problems. And we have seen this with Redis, because instead of SQL, we have chosen Redis. And uh, after talking to some other guys, they finally admitted. It was not like th that they admitted straight away that, OK, we have chosen wrong uh, technology. Because it's, it, if you ask somebody, then uh, he or she will never tell you just like this. You need to dig. And after some digging, uh, s finally, they will admit that. There, there was, it was a bad decision. So uh, for, for other guys, it was MongoDB. So they chose MongoDB, and after a couple of months, they, they saw that they actually need relations. And this is what we also uh, have right now. Just after two weeks of production, and only a couple of users, we had 20,000 of keys that are not related to each other in Redis. So it was like a bucket of values. And now it is so hard to maintain it that we introduce a special class that will group them all together into one object. And this way we will be able to actually manage this, this whole data. If we have chosen SQL in the first place, then we, we wouldn't have such a problem at all. So we wanted to scale up, but actually now we have a lot of code that we need to maintain. And this is a problem that I see it's happening in many projects. And finally, the last thing that, that I'd like to say about mistakes is about deploying application that is quite uh, big, at least in our scale. Uh, so how many of you tried to set up a number like this of virtual machines? Uh, show your hands, please. Like 100 of machines at the same time. Have you tried to do so? OK, I see no hands. Maybe this is something sim uh, familiar. Debian, uh, how many of you are Debian users? OK, so you know it's Packet Manager, right? Apt. Now the question is, how often do you see a message like this, that you need to download some packet and you have 404? OK, you see this and how, what you can do to, to solve it? Just, yes, exactly. <laughs> You can use uh, remove the cache or up update or something like this, and then it will solve the problem. So this is quite common. How about this? Have you ever seen such a problem? So I, I, I am setting up 100 machines, and 95 of them are perfectly fine. Everything is installed, and everything is OK. Then I see five outliers. and. I see error like this, and I'm like, what the hell has ju just happened, right? And uh, then what about this? This is even more interesting. 
Okay, so uh, three of them has have this error, and one of them has this error. And the last one has this error. This is my favorite. It says that it's, it's not able to reopen standard input. And it's running on a non-interactive virtual machine. And it says there's no such file or directory. And this is, this is how it works. And this time, last analogy to other science, this time to chemistry. So in chemistry, there is a thing called island of stability, right? Are you familiar with this? It basically tells you that if you have this number of protons and this number of neutrons, then there is this island in which those particles are stable, stable enough to, to survive some time. And it's the same with deploying uh, in the cloud. So if you're deploying something and you can have five machines that will fail all of the time because of such, of such errors like this, and you cannot get rid of this problem, then it's better to have this state, because we all try to, to, to remove the state, to have everything stateless, and it is a good direction, it is a good thing to have everything stateless, but in some cases, if you want to, to fight with the problems that you are experiencing, either in infrastructure or, I don't know, virtual machines, then you need to introduce this state. In this case, it was creating a base image that contained 95% of the dependencies, and, and then just installing, you know, the top layer uh, in, in, in our strips. So when we then moved to other cloud, uh, the state was lost. So again, we needed to, to recreate this base image. But thanks to this, we were on this stable island uh, in, in which everything was surviving for more than just uh, two days. And I think this picture sums it. And also, <coughs> because now, now I'm going to finish, now I'm going to finish and, you know, it's kind of frustrating. It's kind of frustrating because each day I was going to the office, I was sure that something will be broken. One, one time it was internal DNS services, some latencies, other time it was network disruption and so on, and this is why I have created this. I call it a wheel of misfortune. You can basically, if I go to the office, I can roll it just like this, and I will see that today we have disks unattached. And it is because the disks are, uh, are attached via network. And s there was some global maintenance break, and some machine was down for just one minute, and other day it will be no space left on device or something like this. So to release my frustration and pressure I have created this and this actually solved uh, a lot of my internal problems <laughs> okay this is all I have prepared for you so thank you Thank you, Swavek, a lot for sharing your experiences. Now we know that distributed apps are not that easy. And the wheel of misfortune we need to bear in mind. Would you like to ask some questions to Swavek? Okay, I'm running to you. Thank you, Michal. Hi, Swavek. Kamil Vitecki here. I reckon, uh, yes, I, I So, uh, you have <laughs> already said that issues with dependencies are a big issue, and we should be versioning them very strictly. And you also said that nodes are failing, and when you are upgrading or updating 100 of them, five of them will fail. But then the question is about your applications. So, five of 100 nodes failed, so your applications are running old version. How do you deal with forward and backward compatibility of the interfaces? Uh, well, we need to maintain backward compatibility. You're talking about APIs, right? Uh, I'm talking about any protocols between them. Do you have any hints, any magic that we should apply? So there's no magic. It's just reality and it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> There's no, there's no silver bullet if you uh, need to 
to maintain the backward compatibility for some protocols, then you need to introduce some versioning. It's quite important to, even if you start uh, doing something, then, to then uh, you should think about versioning. Example from my field is that we, in this thread is that I told you, we store some objects, and I pay a lot of attention to attaching just a version field to, to each object. So no matter what it is, I, I always want to have a version equal to one. Even if it is, you know, it looks like it is going to stay one for forever, then I'm still, uh, I, I consider this to be a good idea. So if your protocols have version that you can detect, then maybe this is some option. Okay, that's quite a good idea. I will consider that. And what do you do when you already detect an issue? So do you see that the version doesn't match? Are you detecting it's newer, older? Do you ignore the fact you're looking only for inequality? How do you deal with it? Do you isolate the node? I don't know. So uh, actually, with, with the version, uh, with the project that I'm working on currently, we are not uh, coping with this because we are not there yet. But with example from the application that we did before is that uh, it's quite simple. It's a web application and we were hashing objects. And we were hashing objects and then putting this to URL. And our problem was that when people started exchanging emails with those links, those links were frozen. So it means you can't get, rif get rid of something that is already in, in somebody's mailbox. So we need to uh, support those links like forever. And right now, when frontend sees that it is old-fashioned link, then it needs to communicate with backend. Then backend recalculates something and sends response to frontend, which will redirect you to the proper link. And this is one example. But when it comes to the backend, we haven't uh, had such a problem. I know those kind of problems are apparent in, in applications, but we haven't uh, had such one. So I can't give any advice here. Uh, I wanted to ask about the monitoring tool. So what do you use to actually monitor these hundreds of virtual machines running? And uh, how do you react on failures? Do you have some automate behind the scenes? Or is it still not the scale? Uh, actually, yes. So the scale is not like a scale in, in Google. But we have decided to use Prometheus because it has this uh, push strategy. So it, it, it simply asks your services to, to give metrics. So we are using this with exporters. We also have our custom exporters uh, and also for Celery, which is used for distributed, uh, distributed queues. We have Flower. So this is like uh, a special tool for Celery. And lastly, we use Grafana for visualizing everything. And when it comes to deployment scripts, it's all deployed using bash scripts. And most of the configuration is encoded into uh, cloud init script. So it works that way uh, that you know AWS, right? In AWS, you have this cloud init. It is executed each time the machine is created. So we have auto scaling group. And each time some machine is uh, terminated and some other machine kicks in in its place, uh, it basically starts to execute something after it boots up. So uh, this thing is registering to, uh, to the proper place and then sending metrics when asked. So this is how we do this. And uh, you're gathering logs with Elastic uh, Search, right? Sorry? Inside, inside you're gathering logs inside Elastic Search. Uh, we are using Elastic Search, but we are not using Elastic Search for storing uh, metrics. Uh, Prometheus has its own database. Okay, and uh, regarding logging, uh, logs from different nodes, uh, what do you use for that? Uh, I told this it was EL key stack, uh, Elastic Search, Log Search, and Kibana. Okay. So okay, basically, uh, currently we have only one machine, one Elastic Search, and this brings problems, so perhaps now we will create a cluster for okay. just for logging. Okay, thank you. We have cluster of problems. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So it's like with this joke about Java, right? An engineer decided to, to solve his problem with Java. Now he has a Java, uh, sorry, problem factory. <laughs> and do you have some experience with uh, platform as a service in cloud services? 
because uh, most of the problems you talk about were uh, about the infrastructure. So in platform service, you just don't care about this, but there are some disadvantages, of course. Mm, well, this is kind of platform platform we have. So if you know, because if I don't know whether such a thing can happen in uh, services that are offered publicly, but we have our platforms that are on premises, so they are not perfect, and we have those global maintenance breaks and so on. So, so uh, maybe it hits us only because it's internal, but I s hopefully I did address the question right because it's mostly related to this platform, and our platform is not perfect. Okay, I see one question in the back. Yes, I already have a mic. So, oh. so like my, my question is actually not strictly related to your presentation, maybe, but, you know... Where so are you, sir? <laughs> here. Okay. Here. Here I am. Hanya. <laughs> uh, but uh, since I used to read all the documents very caref carefully, so I'm very curious about what is actually behind those small letters on your title slide? <laughs> <laughs> a good question. Uh, so basically, you know uh, what is being used when you don't uh, know what to put inside of a div element on a web page? Yes, exactly. Lorem ipsum something, something. I don't uh, remember it. Just Google, uh, sorry, duck, duck, go it. And <laughs> Hi. <coughs> Hi. I have two questions. Uh, first is about testing, how you test uh, the, the services that communicate between uh, yeah, services in the distributed architecture. Uh, the second thing is how you find the bottlenecks. Uh, okay, so for the first question, if I understood it correctly, it's about how do we test uh, microservices on, uh, on their own. Yeah, bandar the day boundaries and so on, and communication. Uh, so currently we have tests that are uh, unit tests that are most basic and then we have a couple of tests for particular services and finally end-to-end -end tests. In end-to-end -end tests we deploy everything either uh, locally with Docker Compose or in the cloud and we don't have any tests that are uh, deploying only single microservice because we, all we do all of the testing uh, by doing unit tests. So we either test uh, locally one service or everything uh, as a working system. And also we have resiliency tests that in, in which we try to tear things down and then test how the system is behaving if the Redis database is missing or uh, we do stuff like this. Okay, so then uh, my follow-up to the integration test. Uh, how you deal with the uh, uh, do you have like a staging environment when you run the integration test? Because there's the state, problem with the state. Uh, Each okay, time so it generates some changes. So you're right, and we try to, to fight with this state. Uh, recently we have introduced, because we are using GitLab, so recently we have introduced this GitLab preview apps. I think it comes from Heroku. So basically, once all of the uh, pipeline is green, then it is deployed in the cloud and then further tests can take place. Currently we are just using this for making a review, so we can just go to the merge request and click to see how, how does it look in, in on the real body, right? But, yes. Uh -huh. And about the, s the second question was about how do we find bottlenecks. Uh, well, we are blind, actually. <laughs> It's, I'm sorry to admit that, but uh, we try to to look at the Grafana and to see whether uh, where is the highest CPU utilization, and then we want to answer a question why it is uh, highest over there. But if we have like one hundreds of Elasticsearch nodes, then it's it varies and it's not so easy, and we have no guidelines for this, so we are acting on uh, issue basis. So when something is wrong, then we uh, are trying to, to solve this problem that we have on hand. Okay, one more question regarding uh, testing. 
Do you monitor somehow uh, performance of your system and are you performing uh, some kind of stress test for your system? We have this in plan. We have this in plan because the, the project is ki uh, kind of young. It is uh, like, I don't know, one year. Camille, you can correct me because Camille is working with me in this project. One, one year. So one year is one year and basically me and Camille with just uh, three of students. So so it's not a big project and things are slower than in in st to standard standard project that that we are running in Nokia. So we are not there yet. We are planning to have uh, tests for stress tests for whole backend and also we have a component in front end that uh, is very because our application is to browse logs uh, that are generated by base stations. And uh, when such a file is generated, it can have e even 41 gigabytes. It's the, the biggest one that we, we saw. And we are basically loading part of the database into the browser. So now you have like a lot of lines in your browser, and this is what we also want to test. Uh, we've we gave up with Selenium. It's there's no way it will be stable. Now we are trying with uh, Chrome DevTools protocol. So two types of uh, bottleneck stress tests that, that, that we need to do is one for front-end part and the second for back-end. But we only have plans for this. Mm, I think all the questions were answered. So, Sławek, let me thank you again for preparing this amazing presentation and give him a warm applause as a thank you. Yes, Sławomir Zborowski. Okay, thank you one more time.